documentary. Two of, two of my favorite things to do is watch documentaries and listen to music and uh, play music. And this documentary happened to be about one of my favorite bands. And it kind of started out like typical documentaries where it goes through the course and the history of this band. They kind of give you a brief history on each album they did. Well, halfway through this documentary, this band got the opportunity to play Wembley Stadium. And Wembley Stadium is a, is a huge arena in London, England. And it holds around 85, 90,000 seats. And um, not too many bands get the opportunity to play at Wembley Stadium. And this front man of this band was talking about how much of an honor and how much it meant to him to have that opportunity to play in that stadium. And how they had to put tickets on sale six months ahead of time in order to allow for all those tickets to be sold. Well, it flash forwards forward in the documentary to them playing at this stadium. And the, and the front man, his name's Dave Grohl, he's, he's standing on this catwalk like thing and he's just kind of taking a mental image. And he's not saying anything, he's not playing anything. It's just silent from his aspect. And he's just kind of standing up and he's looking and he's taking a mental image. I was watching that and this is going to sound ridiculous, but I was watching that and it, it, it made me think, you know, I've had the opportunity to preach all over this country. I've also had the opportunity to preach mainly to non-believers. I've had the opportunity to preach in nightclubs, on the porches of crack houses, and alleys, and green rooms, and backstage. And uh, it's been a blessing in my life, but Muncie Alliance, and again, this is probably going to sound ridiculous, and you might not be able to grasp what I'm saying, but Muncie Alliance is similar to my Wembley Stadium. Not because there's a thousands and thousands and thousands of people packed in here, but I think about what this church has, has meant to me. And when I say this church, I mean the church body. I think about the people who were once here and the people who are still here and the people that are going to be coming here. I remember my first day as an intern. Actually, it was my second day as an intern. I went to teaching pool, and the first person I met was Heath, who now is at Princeton finishing up his degree, who was the pastor at Huntington at that time. Heath had a gnarly head of dreadlocks, was well-spoken, soft-spoken individual, had a heart for the gospel, had a heart for Jesus. I met Danny Carroll that day. The first thing Danny Carroll did when, when he met me was come up and hug me and kiss me on the cheek, which kind of <laughs> creeped me out. But he was just letting me know that he knew I was there and he cared. And I met Marty Miller. Danny, actually, Danny is a, a pastor at Fountain Square with Adam Talent. Immersed in a, a neighborhood that's ridden with drugs and crime and gang violence and poverty, bringing the gospel to a, a downtrodden community, and uh, God's doing amazing things through them. I met Marty Miller that day. Marty Miller's now in Fort Collins, and learned of how grounded and rooted his faith was in the Word of Jesus Christ. And and just by listening to him, I was inspired, and I was I was really checked. And I, I, I love Marty. He's such a, such a great man in Christ. And I think of Vince Stoltz. Vince treating me like a biological son when I came into the internship and literally holding my hand at times when I was fearful and afraid and not knowing what was going to happen, walking me through things. I think of Guy Fonz sitting in teaching pool, Listen to all these young, budding pastors with all their different eschatologies and all their different theologies and all their different passions for the gospel and kind of reining them in, you know. Guy and Judy, I'll be honest with you. Every time I come in here on Sunday morning, the first thing I do is I look to see if you guys are, are here. And when I see that you guys are here, it makes me happy. I'm glad that you have the courage through your faith to stay here and experience reconciliation, experience restoration. You know, God, we've, we've had our differences, you know. 
and I had to come to the conclusion that I can't help it that you're wrong about the rapture. <laughs> it's not my fault, man. You're gonna have to work that out with God. <laughs> I'm just joking. I just like giving God a hard time about his eschatology. Ours is pretty sip. Ours are pretty similar. Similar, similar is in like night and day, but pretty similar. <laughs> Oh, I'm just joking. But my prayer for you and for both of you and my desire is that if I can come up here and preach here and there and come alongside you, then I want to do it. But my desire is for you to do what you need to do now and get back up here healthy. You know? That's my desire. Because I, I know someday in the not so distant future, you and me are going to be shoulder to shoulder praising our God as He's in front of us. Amen, right? Yeah. Today I'm going to talk about Luke 8. And usually I harp on sanctification, but today I'm going to harp on faith. I wish I had time to harp on both because sanctification is such an amazing thing. But Luke 8. I always say this every time I get up here, but I think you guys know I'm a Jesus guy. I love the gospel. Um, I like talking about Jesus. I like talking about what Jesus has done in my life, what I've seen Jesus do with this, when the Spirit moves. I love watching the Spirit move. But Luke 8 is interesting. We're going to see faith. We're going to see faith tested. We're going to see Jesus teaching. We're going to hear the, the words of, of Christ. And uh, it's very exciting. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. At this time, Jesus had been banished from the synagogues. He'd been kicked out. So... He went on what I would call the offensive, and he took to the road. He took to going to cities, towns, villages, and teaching his message. And the, the first couple things that really pop out to me in this first three verses of Luke 8 is how the apostles were with him, but then you had these women. And you had Mary, who was from the town of Magdala. That's why she's called Mary Magdalene. And you had Joanna, who was the spouse of Herod's household manager. Now Mary had what we could call a checkered past. She had a dark past. Uh, Christ had cast seven demons out of her. Some translations say seven devils. I'm reading out of the ESV today, and the ESV says seven demons. And healed her of infirmities. Now an infirmity is a mental or physical weakness. And what she came out of was a dark, questionable past. And then you have Joanna, whose husband's job is to look after the king's personal finances, his personal, personal property, his opportunity for financial gain. So he had one of the highest positions in the kingdom, and if not the, the highest, a close second, as being more... Uh, on a personal level and in a personal relationship with the king than any other of his workers. And what really jumps out to me is that how you have people, polar opposites, that come together, that Christ has brought together for ministry. You have people on an earthly sense and an earthly scale would never be yoked together. They would never have the opportunity or the chance to do anything together. You have Mary who would be on the outskirts of society on the lower on the lower level. And then you have Joanna who would be in upper society. But from the outside, it looks like these women aren't really doing anything. It looks like these women are just tagging along. And this is the other thing that really jumps out to me. These women supported Jesus and the apostles. 
during their ministry out of their own means. And that's amazing to me because like when I, when I opened up the introduction of the sermon, I, I talked about a lot of names and some people that are here. And I, I didn't talk about some people that are still here. But I did that because it's easy at a medium-sized church like this church to think that you're not connected or you're not doing anything or you're not serving a purpose or nobody knows who you are or nobody knows your name or nobody even cares. I felt like that and I think we all have at one point or another. And I look at these women who are in the same sense. If I was to walk up on Jesus teaching, I would just think these people are following along. I, I wouldn't know the support that they're, they're filling. I think of Joe Trotty calling me up out of nowhere a few weeks back just to tell me that he loved me and he supported me. And I think uh, Brad Runda come and picking me up just to hang out, just to spend time with me. I think of Dean Rundell hanging out with me just to get to know me, just to hear what I had to say and not talk about anything and specifically just to hang out. A few weeks ago I got to hang out with Aaron Fisher and Stu Godfrey and, and we were hanging out and watching those two dudes make fun of each other was very uplifting as brothers in Christ. <laughs> I love just having time with them and seeing them, seeing them joke. Eldon Morehouse, Eldon and Louise Morehouse, coming alongside me and going through sermon preparation with me, how to prepare a sermon, how to prepare for a wedding ceremony, or how to do a, a funeral service for a non-believer. And Louise walking alongside with my wife on what it's like being a pastor's spouse, sharing some of her experience, the good and the bad, and walking alongside us. And, and the reason why I, I bring these names up is because it looks like I, mean, I don't think Joe or Brad or any of those guys know what it really meant to me. Like, Joe just called me up and talked to me on the phone for two minutes. I don't think he really knows how much it meant to me and, and where I was at on that particular day or when Dean and I hung out or when Brad and I hung out, what it was like and, and what it really meant to me. And what I'm saying is, you know, I, I believe right now at MAC, this is a very interesting time because this is a time where we're going to get to see the Spirit move. This is a time where we're going to see God move, and I don't think God's done yet. I, I know God's not done yet, but I know that God is here with us, and it looks like there's people in this church body that aren't doing anything, and actually they're, they're coming alongside me. They do not know how insouciant they have been on my ministry. And I go, I go all, all over the country preaching the message to people that hate it, but hopefully some will listen. But there's people that have been through in this church who are now all over the country. Caleb's in Thailand. Draper's in Europe. We'll be in Portland soon. Maybe not soon enough, but soon. <laughs> bringing the kingdom of God, bringing the message of Jesus Christ. And it's easy to get down on yourself. I'm, like, I'm thankful for this, this church body because, like I said, you know, I've, been, I've, I've been blessed and had the opportunity to preach in a lot of different venues. And uh, it's, every venue is always different. Um, you you kind of have to gauge your audience. And it's always comforting to preach to people that aren't spitting and throwing beer bottles. That's really nice. Uh, but at the same time, you've all had an impact on me. You've had an impact on my wife. And that does mean there. it's not good all the time. It won't be good all the time because if it is, it's... It's fake. It's false. But now we're in a time where we're going to get to see the Spirit move. And this is a time where we can come alongside and cling to the cross and surrender to the Word. And when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it, and some fell on rock, and as it grew, it withered away, because it had no moisture. 
Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. <clears throat> In Palestine, where they were at, there was farm ground. And in between these farm ground, these plots of farm ground, there would be what was called rights of way. And a right of way was a legal passageway for anybody to walk. And it was about close to three feet wide. And I believe as Jesus was walking, he came up to this area. And he did what was, was common in Jewish culture. He started to teach in a parable. Now, a parable is a brief story that illustrates a principle or a lesson. It has a setting, it has a result, and then ultimately has a reaction. We see parables all throughout the Old Testament. You see them in 2 Samuel, you see them in Isaiah, you see them in Ezekiel. And Jesus begins to speak. And what he says first is that some seed that fell onto the path was exposed on the path. The path was hard. It's just like when you walk in grass in your yard. Over the course of time, whatever you're walking on will start to die. It'll get hard. You will stamp all the moisture out of it. So what happens is when the seed falls on the path, it's exposed and there's no way for it to grow and at times birds of the air will devour it and then you have the rocky soil now the rocky soil isn't soil that's littered with boulders and pebbles and things like that what the rocky soil is in Palestine all around the farmland there would be thin layers of soil directly beneath it would be sheets of limestone so when the seed was placed in the soil when the seed falls into the soil it would grow it would start to sprout up but what would happen is there wouldn't be enough time for a sufficient root structure to be in place there wouldn't be enough moisture because of the stone and it would wither and die and then you had the seed that fell into thorny soil and soil with weeds. And in the soil, the seed falls in and it starts to grow. It starts to sprout. It comes up. But as it's growing, the seeds of thorns and the seeds of weeds, their roots grow faster and stronger. They take all the nourishment out of the soil. They take all the moisture ultimately choking out the sprout and it withers and it dies and then you have the seed that fell into good ground good ground basically consists of three things it's a deep soil it's clean and it's well prepared so when the seed falls into good soil it starts to grow it has enough food and moisture to grow a sufficient root system and it sprouts up and ultimately it bears fruit. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. I don't believe that Jesus spoke to hide his message. I don't believe that Jesus spoke to be cryptic so we wouldn't hear what he was saying. I do believe, though, from Scripture that Jesus did speak to teach. And I love how there would always be a, a physical aspect but as well as a spiritual aspect to Christ's message and to the words that he used. Matthew 13 records this parable a little bit different. Um, it kind of gave me a little bit of insight into this during my, my research this past week. But in Matthew 13, Matthew records that Jesus said, you know, 
There's been many prophets and righteous men who wanted to see what you see. There's been many prophets and righteous men who wanted to hear what you hear, but didn't. Christ is, is referencing his identity in this. I, I believe that it, this is an indication of the result rather than the objective. Christ is exposing his identity. Now the apostles' faith are still, still growing, and we'll talk about that later. But Christ is referencing who he is in the Father. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and the time of testing fall away. And as for those that fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, Hold it fast and an honest and good heart. And I love this last part. And bear fruit with patience. I'll read that one more time. And bear fruit with patience. This is interesting when, when Jesus explains this parable because me personally, I can at times in my walk be rooted in all four of these different kinds of soil. The soil, or the seed, being the Word of God that fell on the path that's hard is when we, is when we close our hearts, is when we close our eyes, we shut our ears. I think of Stephen before the council in Acts 7, preaching the Word of God, and what do they do before they stone him? They cover their ears. They do not want to hear. It's when we say things like, well, if I can't see it with my eyes, then I don't believe it. It's when we close our minds. We Christians never get accused of being closed-minded, do we? Ever. I never get that. But we're always closed-minded sometimes to the Word of God, which is interesting. It's when we think we're tough. You know, you ever think you're tough? It's like, no matter what happens, I'm going to be grounded in faith. No matter what happens in my life, I'm going to surrender to the will of God. I think we're tough. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. A couple of weeks ago, um, I, sometimes I think I'm tough. Sometimes I think I'm grounded in faith. And then God throws little things my way to remind me how I'm not that tough. A couple Thursdays ago, I woke up at like 4.30 in the morning. And I had this, this pain in my lower back. And... And I woke up, and it hurt really bad. I've never really experienced any pain like this before. And I got up, and to try to get my mind off, off the pain, I started listening to, to Neil Young. So I'm like listening to Neil Young in our living room at like 4.30 in the morning. And um, this pain just keeps getting worse. And uh, like 6.30 rolls around, and it's time for us to get our daughter Michaela ready for school. So we get her up, and get her ready for school and take her off to school and this pain is continually getting worse and my wife had just gotten out of the hospital like a day earlier and I come I come here and, and start roasting coffee at AWC and as I'm roasting coffee this this it was like this stinging burning sensation in my lower back I've never felt anything like it before well um, it, it just continues to go on. I look at Mike Mitchell, who's standing next to me, and I said, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go home and check on my wife because I didn't want him to know I was in pain because I'm tough, right? Well, I, I drive home, and we live like two minutes from here, and by the time I get home, the pain's so bad, I'm crying. Like, I may have tears coming down. I'm, I'm crying like a, like a little boy on the first day of kindergarten that missed his mama. I mean, I'm just <laughs> crying. And I go inside... And uh, I thought, man, I'll just lay down and try to shake this pain off, try to get my mind off of it. And I lay down, and I immediately stand up, and I'm rolling on the ground. I'm all over the place. 
Long story short, my, my wife takes me to the ER and uh, they give me a CAT scan and a doctor walks in and, and uh, two RNs and the doctor comes in and he says, hey, you got a kidney stone, that's why you're in so much pain. And uh, one of the RNs goes, she goes, yeah, it's going to feel like you're giving birth, you know. <laughs> and then the doctor looks at her and me and goes, well, yeah, but it'll feel like you're giving birth, but babies are smooth and round and this is sharp and jagged. <laughs> and then the other RN looks at me and goes, yeah, sharp and jagged like an arrowhead and even like makes the... The only thing I could think of at that time was that Cat Stevens song, Trouble. I knew I was in trouble, but you know what? I knew it wasn't that tough. Something as small as a kidney stone it made me realize how tough I'm not, let alone in the spiritual aspect. And then you have the seed that is placed, that falls into rocky soil. And this is when we hear the word. And we see it, and we embrace it, and maybe we even embrace it with joy. But our spiritual life is short, it's brief. And the ways of the world and our spiritual life have no boundaries, and the lines start to get distorted, and then our spiritual life withers and dies. And then you have the seed that falls into soil with thorns and weeds. This is when we hear the word. This is when we see the will of God. And our spiritual life grows. We sprout up out of the ground. I was on, I was on tour like a month ago and we were playing in the city and we got to the venue like a couple hours early. And um, we go in and we walk into this club and the doors don't open for a couple hours and there's another band who had made it into town early also and we walk in and they're, they already have their trailer unloaded and they come up to us and said, hey man, are, you, guys, you guys are a Christian band, right? I said, yeah, we're, we're a Christian band, dude. He said, oh, we're, we're a Christian band too, man, and I'm a pastor and so-and-so over here is a youth pastor and so-and-so over here is also a pastor and it was on the road I love running into other Christian bands because it, it it lifts me up because you're in dark places all the time and it's just it's sad and depressing well over the course of time we do sound check together we start trading riffs and we're trading guitar strings and stuff and working on our guitars together and working on our tubes together and we pray over each other and it, it was a great time and like it was really cool because like everything was silent in this and it was, this was a theater. Everything was silent in this theater. And we were just praying. And it's cool being like in a, a somewhat bigger building and just praying to God with five or six other individuals. Well, they ended up going on first that night. And um, first thing they do when they come out, go right into it, why they're there. So we're here for one reason, and that's to tell you about Jesus Christ. And I always love that because like, I'm used to playing with bands that aren't talking about Jesus Christ and they're talking about some of the other things in life that lead to death and destruction and bondage. And it, it always makes me feel good when I hear that and I see other people doing it. And it makes me want to come alongside them. So I'm watching them from the stage and in between every song it's all they talked about. They're giving parts of their testimony. They're talking about what Jesus has done in their life. They're talking about things they used to struggle with. And then they get off and... and they tear down, and then we end up. We played like four hours later that night, and in some of the nicer venues and theaters, you'll have something called a green room. And in the green room, it's like behind the the stage area, and it'll have like showers and a restroom and a washer and dryer, so you can do laundry. And there'll be like an entertainment center back there, and then they'll have like a bunch of food. And um, I rarely go back to the green rooms because um, I'm just always out doing ministry. I mean, that's why we're on the road. So the only time I go back there is if I'm sick and I, and I want to sleep. But um, I'll be out hanging out on the side of the stage, watching, watching the other bands, praying for divine appointments, praying over people, going outside, praying for divine appointments around the, around the venue, and, and meeting some really, really interesting individuals. Well, as the course of the night goes on, there's this uh, 
commotion coming from the green room and I'm standing on the side of the stage and I see all these like security dudes and then like nicer venue security guys wear uh, suits you know and they're like a foot taller than me and they have like a hundred pounds on me and they not the kind of dudes you want to mess with I see all these security guys going back to the green room so my curiosity got the best of me so I walk back there and I'm like like getting in between all these security guards because they're just standing there and I walk in and I see one of my band members uh, I could hear him before I got there. I could tell he wasn't very happy, but he was yelling. And um, I go back in there and I walk in and I see lines of cocaine and I see uh, pot. They're smoking dope. And uh, that's common on the road, but it's not common to see a band preaching the message of Jesus Christ 30 minutes or two hours earlier and then going backstage and putting cocaine in their nostrils. And it's really disheartening, and it's really upsetting. Well, one of my band members got to him before I did, and, and he was yelling. I'm not the kind that, that really yells. Um, he was yelling. He was upset. And he ends up walking away. And I just sat and talked with him. And I wanted to say, you know, like, I looked at it, and I, I thought of all the the friends I've lost, man, the, the friends that I wish I could, I wish I could see again, I wish I could laugh with, uh, I wish I could play music with again, but I can't. I didn't really talk about that though. I brought up Luke 8 to him actually, which is funny that I'm preaching this today. I brought up Luke 8 because they were, it's not that they were doing drugs, it's that they were justifying why they were able to do drugs because of Jesus Christ. So what was happening is they were using grace, as I would call a credit card, where you can swipe your sin on it, and it's okay. And they ended up, they started yelling at me, and when people yell at me for the most part, I laugh, which makes people yell even more. <laughs> um, but I just had to walk away, and it reminded me of this, where they've heard the word, They've seen it. They're growing. I wouldn't want to be a member of their congregation. I would be upset if I found out one of my pastors was doing cocaine and other drugs on the road while they're doing ministry. But they're not bearing fruit. They're not mature in the Word. And then you have the good soil. This is the soil when the seed is planted in us and the seed is planted in our hearts. We start to grow. And our will no longer is really of our own. It's not what we want. We don't look for validity from the earth or validity from men. We don't look at ourselves for identity. We see our identity in the body of Christ. We, are see, we see our identity in Jesus and we start to bear fruit we start to come together and this is what's amazing about the body of Christ how he brings people together and when he brings people together he still brings their personalities personalities together the qualities and the aspects of these people he brings us together that's amazing, and that's really uplifting to me. I would love to talk about sanctification right now because, man, I really could. Well, maybe one of these days I'll write a book, Guy on Sanctification. It could be part of the licensure process for the CMA. I love sanctification, I'm sorry. I have so much more I want to talk about, though. No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be made known and come to light. Take care then how you hear, for to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has, will be taken away. I love this parable because it really speaks to me. And while we're on the road, I always get a couple comments and questions on the road and, and one I always get is, 
you know, like, hey, man, I really like you, or you're a really nice guy, but why can't you leave all this Jesus talk for Sunday mornings? Or I get the, the ever so often comment, you know, why is it that you want everybody to believe exactly the same way you do? Why is it that you want to brainwash everybody so we're all just sheep and follow the same God and chain to the same God and have no freedom? And it's funny, this week I wrote down on paper what I say because I realized over the course of time I started having the same answers to these comments and questions that I would get from people. And those kind of questions always come from non-believers. And what I say on the road is, you know, any artist who's w worth his own salt is going to write about what he loves and what he believes in. But if he truly loves what he believes in and he truly has faith in what he believes in, that faith will have no boundaries. That faith will not cease to exist in any aspect of his life, whether it's your professional life, your spiritual life, your personal life, your life between a loved one, your relational life, whether it makes you the uncool guy at work because you're known as the religious guy, whether it makes you as the weird one in your family because you're the one who follows Jesus. And we all know that this looks crazy to the world because it is crazy to the world. But we also know that we've seen this and we've heard this and that is why it makes sense to us. Why? Because we have Jesus. You know, the Holy Spirit was sent in the name of Jesus by the Father. You know that? The Holy Spirit was sent in the name of Jesus by the Father. You were marked with a seal. That seal is the Holy Spirit. That's inside of you. That's, there's authority in that. That authority is from the Father. It's not on our own. Man, I can talk about sanctification again right here. I'm not going to. I have some interesting stories about faith I want to tell you that I'm going to tie into part of this chapter. Then his mother and brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. I don't think Jesus was actually denying his mom and his brothers. What he was doing was referencing his identity. He was saying who he was. I think of the book of James. A faith without action is what? It's dead. It's really not a faith at all. And Jesus says, my mother and my brothers and my sisters are those who hear the word of God and they do it. They do it. That doesn't mean we have to go out and bomb abortion clinics. That doesn't mean we have to go out and pick and fall, pick at fallen soldiers' funerals. That means we surrender to the will of God. We surrender before the cross. And it's nothing we have done. Like Ephesians 2, we are saved by grace. It's nothing on our own account. It's what He has done for us. It's what saves us. I don't know why God called me, but I do know that He did. I do know that He did. And I do know Him. I do know Him. But it's also easy to, to find yourself on shaky ground sometimes and to not know which way to go and to not know which foot to step ahead of the other one next. I'm going to see something that happens in the next part of this chapter where Jesus calms a storm. What happens is they go out on the lake and they're in a boat and Jesus falls asleep. It must have been peaceful to watch Jesus sleep. This is something that came up in my mind when I was studying this. It must have been peaceful to watch Jesus sleep. But what happened was a storm came. The wind started blowing, water started coming down, the boat started taking on water. The apostles wake Jesus and he rebukes the wind and the raging waters and it ceases. But then he asked the apostles, 
where's your faith? Where's your faith? Because when they woke him, they said, Master, we're perishing here. We're going down. We're sinking. How many times have you ever said that? Have you ever prayed a prayer where you pray God to understand your will, why God should answer this? And then you come back to that prayer weeks down the road, and then you thank God for not answering that prayer? Isn't that funny how sometimes our wills get out of alignment with, with what God's will is? But he asks, where is your faith? I'm going to tell you a story about um, somebody who's really special to me. My family's from the South, so I never had like a, I never called my grandparents like grandma or grandpa. I had like a granddad, a meemaw, and a grandpappy. And like my grandpappy was from the hills, didn't know his birthday, never had a birth certificate. Social Security office had a different birthday as the Army did. Um, he kind of knew within a few weeks and maybe a couple years, uh, but he was one of the most like influential men in my life. Um, I, he, he was very kind to me. He was very loving. Would always hug me. Always tell me he loved me. Uh, I used to talk to him all the time. Um, and I, I want to tell you this story because it's a, it was a conversation between him and I about faith. It's just kind of a graphic story. Um, I was questioning on whether or not to tell it until last week when I was here and I saw Vince's sermon and some of the words that he used. I'm really not afraid to tell this story anymore. I see Vince laughing at me right now. It was great, man. God was speaking through you. But my grandpappy was a guy, um, he lived life differently. He really did. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of brief stories to kind of give you an idea about his personality. I remember one time he, brought my he bought my brother a BB gun. My brother was older than me. And the first thing my brother did was shoot out the window in his truck. And the only thing he did was laugh and say, nice shot. I remember one time when I was like 12, he took me to Mexico. At that time, he lived like two hours from the border. And he took me to Mexico and we walked across the bridge and in Laredo. And we go over there and we spent the day. He bought like his insulin and all his medications that he needed. And at that time, he was like 68, 69 years old. And we'd go down to Mexico. He'd buy me like switchblades and stuff. It's pretty funny. Um, but he bought this, it looked like a stick of dynamite. It was red and it had a wick on top. And I didn't question what it was at the time. Um, I remember him buying it off of a street vendor in Mexico. And, the next day, uh, we're, at that time, he was living in a trailer in a town of about 200. It was this very rural area of uh, Texas. And uh, I'm outside, and he comes up to me and says, Hey, man, uh, you want to light this? And I said, Well, what is that? You know? And he says, It's a five minute smoke bomb. It's like, Five minute smoke bomb? Okay. He says, Well, when you light it, throw it underneath my trailer. I've been waiting to hear that all my life, you know. <laughs> so he gives me this five-minute smoke bomb, and, and as I start to light it, I look over, and he, he pulls out his, his shotgun. And now, like, I've, I wasn't raised around guns. I was raised around books. My dad, like, read books. That's what he did. And the gunshots I heard were all on TV, so... And the gunshots on TV aren't very loud. Well, I light this five-minute smoke bomb, and I get scared, and I hand it to him. So then he throws it under the trailer, and then he looks at me, and he goes, Now get ready, because when they come out, they come out mad. <laughs> and he starts, you know, that shh, And I said, When what come out? And he looks at me, and he goes, Rattlesnakes. And then just starts popping off rounds. He had been bitten by a rattlesnake a couple months early and, and was in the hospital for like a week because of it. And he found out they were burrowing underneath his trailer. So every, every month he would throw a five-minute smoke bomb from Mexico and these rattlesnakes would come out. And now, now mind you, though, I'm like, I, I think I was 12 or 13. But he's popping off rounds out of this, like, 12-gauge. It's loud. I can't see past my knees and there's rattlesnakes coming out. So the first thing I do was I, 
I run and jump on the hood of his car and I'm just like <laughs> screaming, covering my ears. And he's like picking up rattlesnakes going, look how big this one is, you know, and I'm just <laughs> running away. That was, that was my grandpappy, man. He was just an awesome dude. He passed away a year ago in February and, and when he died, um, I thought I would just be very devastated. And actually, through God's mercy, um, I was just so, so thankful to God that he put him in my life for 30 years. Um, and my daughter got to, got to be with him for, for the first eight years of her life. And he was so good to my daughter. So good. He was such a loving man. He was a Christian. And uh, flash forward to, oh man, this is years ago. Michaela was like, my daughter was like one or two. And we're, we're down in South Texas. At this time, he's living outside of Houston. And we're hanging on his back porch. We're listening to George Jones. And we're drinking coffee. And it's like in the evening time. And I was a believer at the time too. And um, Michaela's playing out in the yard and, and we're just kind of hanging out on the swing. And I looked at him and I said, I said, hey man, because I could talk to him about anything. And when I say anything, I really mean anything. I said, hey grandpappy, uh, are you afraid to die? And he, he looked at me you know, and he said, no, I'm not afraid to die. And he, he held my hand. Um, he said, you know, I, I don't look forward to not being able to see you grow and not being able to see your wife and, and daughter, but I'm not afraid to die. And he goes, what about you? Are you afraid to die? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm actually terrified to die, grandpappy. He said, why? I said, well, I know you look at me like a grandson and, and you look at me with love, but there's a lot of things I've done that I'm ashamed about. There's a lot of wrong I've done that I, I knew was wrong when I did it and still did it for years. And I know I'm going to have to answer for that. And he told me this story, and the story is really graphic. It's a war story. Um, man, I didn't think it'd be hard to talk about him. It's really hard to talk about him. But in the story, <clears throat> he was in South Poland. And he woke up in the snow, and the only thing he had was a knife and a, and a flamethrower. And all of the members of his company were dead. And he says he remembers looking up, and there was this two-story house. And in this two-story house on the first floor, there was what he would find out was a 50 caliber machine gun pointing out the window. On the second story, there was another one pointing in, in the opposite direction. And he said where he was at was basically down a cliff. So there was nowhere he could go without giving up where he was, without exposing where he was, in, and it was just white snow everywhere. So he burrowed through the snow up to the house. And there must have been allied troops everywhere because they're still firing these machine guns. As he's telling me this, he's just like, he's just crying and, and, and this happened in, oh man, 1946, 1945. And he goes in and he had his knife and he goes up behind the first German soldier and they're firing their gun and he goes up and he slits their, slits their throat they fall he goes upstairs does the same thing now the German helmet I'm like a history buff especially about some of the world wars in Vietnam the German helmet was different than any of the other allies or the Axis helmets. It came down in the back. It kind of covered behind back, the back of the ear. The German helmet was very um, easy to tell it was a German helmet. And I had this picture as he's telling me the story. I'd never heard the story before. And I had this picture of what it was like walking in. But as he went up behind these German soldiers, both of them, he said as they fell, after he 
killed them, the helmet fell off and all this hair fell down and they were women. At that point in the war, Adolf Hitler started using young kids, 12, 13, 14 years old, and women to fight the war. Now, it's not that my grandpappy was saying, look, my sin is worse than yours, and if I'm not afraid, then you shouldn't be afraid. It's that his faith was stronger than mine. And I was a believer at the time. Now, the, the praise band can come up, because this is what I'm going to end with, all right? I want to ask you where your faith is. Where your faith is rooted. Is it rooted in the Word? Is it rooted in the world? That was close. Is it rooted in validity from men? Or is it rooted in God? Because all these skeletons in your closet... All these terrible things that you don't want to talk about. I want to charge you to not let the enemy use that as a tool to come in between the relationship of you and Jesus. Because if you think that all the things you've done in your life, all the crazy things you've done in your life, that Jesus hasn't taken on the sin of the world, and that He hasn't taken on your sin also, that's heresy. And as you go out today, as you walk to your car, as you go to work this week, as you run into the good things and the bad things that this week is going to present, I want, you to, I want you to say one thing to yourself. I want you to say that Jesus knows your name. You're not a nameless face in the crowd. He knows who you are. We're all different parts of the body, but we're all of one body, and that body is Jesus Christ. And that's the truth. I hope you find rest in that. I hope you find peace in that. Because I know any part of my life where Jesus is, it's calm. But any part of my life where I've not allowed Jesus to come in or I've kept Jesus out, it's filled with discord. It's filled with chaos. It's filled with anger and bitterness and all sorts of terrible things that ultimately come in between the relationship of me and Jesus Christ.
You pray with me? <clears throat> Dear Father, I just, uh, I thank you. I just ask you to just keep us close to you, Father. Keep our eyes clear and keep our hearts open, keep our, keep our hearts soft. Um, I ask you just to make your, your presence obnoxiously evident. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.